are getting to know by now, the word of God has seven layers of meaning. For example, on a superficial level, Proverbs 31 is referring to the character qualities of a godly woman. But when you look into a deeper layer, by studying the Hebrew meaning of each word in the verses of Proverbs 31, it brings out a much deeper meaning, which reveals the identity of the Bride of Christ. And so in a deeper layer, Proverbs 31 is also relevant to men, because the Bride of the Messiah consists of both men and women. Understandably, it's much more difficult for the men to picture themselves as the Bride of Christ than for women. I can remember in a conference that we did in Singapore, one man in the audience sent me a handwritten note that said, it's hard enough trying to understand what you've been telling me that God is my father, and now you are describing Jesus as my husband. Surely that is describing an inappropriate relationship. As a man, I struggle to get my mind around picturing myself as a bride. And I think that most men can identify with that. To imagine yourself as a bride, you don't have to picture yourself as a female in a white wedding dress. I am going to show you in scripture that this bride is also a mighty warrior bride. So for the men, when you picture yourself as the bride, you can picture yourself as a mighty warrior. One of the reasons God instituted marriage was to give us a physical picture of the type of intimate relationship that Jesus wants to have with us as our spiritual bridegroom, where we are his bride. Just like the role of the husband in a marriage relationship is to love and protect and provide and so on, so that is the role of Yeshua, our bridegroom, in his relationship with us. And just like it is the role of the wife to submit, so we submit to Yeshua as our spiritual husband. For the men to understand this concept of being his bride, it helps to focus on the role of the bride rather than, than the gender. Proverbs 31 verse 10 says, Who can find a virtuous woman? Her value is far above rubies. The Hebrew word for virtuous is chel, which has two meanings. The first meaning is fearless. Because remember, Philippians 4 verse 6 says that we must be anxious for nothing. So Hale means fearless, brave, and the powerful physical force of an entire army. So this is describing somebody who is a warrior in an army. The other meaning of Hale is the ability to do something that is morally pure and worthy. The root word for chel is the Hebrew word chul, which means waiting or to wait expectantly for her bridegroom. So this is describing somebody who is not only a warrior, but also a bride. This is describing the identity of somebody who is a warrior bride. To put all of that information about the meaning of the word virtuous in Proverbs 31 verse 10, as it relates to our identity as the bride of the Messiah, into a sentence in the form of a faith declaration, it would be this. I am virtuous. I am a fearless, overcoming, warrior bride of the Messiah who is equipped with the ability to do what is morally pure and worthy, with the power in the spirit to accomplish this, that would equal the force of an entire army should it be converted to a physical force. When you fly on a plane, as the aeroplane takes off, you can feel the powerful physical force of the jet behind you, as the plane lifts up on, um, from the runway. And that often reminds me of this word, chael, that we have the powerful physical force 
of an entire army behind us, equipping us with the ability to do what God calls us to do. The powerful physical force of what army would that be, by the way? Heaven's armies. If you connect the dots with other scriptures, such as Ephesians 1 verse 19, it says that the immeasurable, unlimited and surpassing power of God is on the inside of us. And just as I've been explaining to you from Revelation chapter 12, you have the powerful force of the whole of heaven's armies behind you. So to repeat it again, if we were to say this as a faith confession, it would go like this. I am virtuous. I am a fearless, overcoming warrior bride of the Messiah. I am anointed with the immeasurable, unlimited and surpassing power of Yahweh, which equips me with the ability to do what is morally pure and worthy, with the power in the spirit to accomplish this, that would equal the force of an entire army should it be converted to a physical force. The whole of heaven's armies are behind me. And then in verse 13 of Proverbs 31, it says, She seeks wool and flax, which is linen, and works willingly with her hands. The Hebrew word for seek is derash, which means to follow, seek, and learn from Yahweh alone. The Hebrew word for will is teme, which means the whiteness of a bridal garment. Isn't that interesting and amazing? Ephesians 5 verse 25 to 26 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such things, that she might be holy and faultless. In the scripture, it speaks about the bride being washed in the water of the word, so that she is wearing clean white garments without spots or wrinkles. What does it mean to have spots on our wedding garments? Those black spots on our spiritual garments are our old mindsets and lifestyle patterns that come from the kingdom of darkness. For example, fear, anxiety, worry, stress, guilt, shame, rejection, unworthiness, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, hurt, offense, strife, or participating in the things of Babylon, fleshliness, lukewarmness, etc. And just like a dirty wedding dress stained with black ink spots would not look very nice on a person's wedding day in the natural, so it is the same with our spiritual wedding garments. So we need to wash our wedding garments spiritually. And just like we would wash our clothes in the physical with water and soap, so we can also wash our spiritual wedding garments in the same way. Where the soap is the blood of Yeshua, which we apply to our lives when we repent. 1 John 1 verse 9 says that the blood of Yeshua washes us of all unrighteousness. Psalm 51 verse 7 says, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Isaiah 1 verse 18 says, come now, and let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. So, for example, when we repent for fear or for holding on to hurt, offense, anger, bitterness and unforgiveness in our heart or for participating in Babylon and worldliness in some area of our lives, that black ink stain on our wedding garment will be removed by the blood of Yeshua, just like soap rubs off a stain on our clothes in the natural. But then in the natural, you also need water to fully wash it off. 
And in the same way, after repenting, we need to renew our minds in that area that we repented for through the washing of the water of the word, which means changing our thinking and subsequently our way of living to come in line with God's ways as outlined in his word. So, for example, instead of holding on to hurt, offense and bitterness in our heart, we now renew our minds to walk in forgiveness as scripture teaches. So in summary, just like we wash dirty clothes with soap and water in the natural, so we need soap and water to wash our spiritual wedding garments. The blood of Yeshua is like soap and his word is like the water that cleanses our wedding garments. We apply the blood of Yeshua through repentance and we apply the water of the word through renewing our minds in order to get rid of those old filthy mindsets from the kingdom of darkness that are putting black ink spots on our wedding garments spiritually so that our wedding garments become white. This is how we make sure that we are ready when Yeshua returns and are wearing white wedding garments spiritually ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm reminded of a special song that my precious 93-year-old grandmother taught me just before she recently passed away, and it goes like this. This old world can never hold me. Any moment I'll be gone. For I've made my consecration and I have my wedding garments on. Those who don't wash their wedding garments spiritually and remain unchanged where their soul and lives has not gone through the transformation process of sanctification and are therefore lukewarm will not be found ready at the rapture and will be left behind to go through the great tribulation as Yeshua warned for example in the parable of the ten virgins. This is a final act of God's mercy because the circumstances of the great tribulation are so extreme that it's impossible for a person to stay lukewarm. Either their hearts will grow cold and they will give in under the extreme pressure to take the mark of the beast and deny their faith in Yeshua as they fall away from God. Or they will repent and their hearts will become hot on fire for God as they allow themselves to be purified and sanctified in the refiner's fire of the hardships of the time of the great tribulation. So this is their last chance to make a choice, cold or hot. And in this time, they will have to wash their garments through the same process that they should have done before the rapture. As we see, for example, in Daniel 12, verse 10, Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined by these trials, but the wicked will continue in their wickedness, and none of them will understand. Only those who are wise will know what it means. Now coming back to our Hebrew word study of Proverbs 31, the Hebrew word for will is tzemeh, which means the whiteness of a bridal garment. And we have now seen how the whiteness of a bridal garment represents the sanctification of our soul from the mindsets that come from the image of the serpent and the kingdom of darkness through renewing our mind with the word of God and applying the blood of the lamb through repentance. The Hebrew word for willingly is chetes. This means to have a great desire for and to find great pleasure in. The Hebrew word for hands is kaf, which means bowing down in worship. So this bride of Christ is not only a warrior, but also a worshiper. This is describing the identity of somebody who is a worshiping warrior bride. And that is why you will often hear me referring to the Bride of Christ 
as a worshipping warrior bride because that is our role in the end times. So just to finish off all that I've just explained and to put all of this information that I've shared from Proverbs 31 verse 10 and 13 into a sentence as a faith confession, it would go like this. I am virtuous. I am a fearless, overcoming warrior bride of the Messiah. I am anointed with the immeasurable, unlimited and surpassing power of Yahweh, which equips me with the ability to do what is morally pure and worthy, with the power in the spirit to accomplish this, that would equal the force of an entire army should it be converted to a physical force. The whole of heaven's armies are behind me. I follow Yahweh to learn from him alone, and I seek the whiteness of my bridal garment, as I find great pleasure in him and have a great desire to bow down in worship to him. So remember who you are in Christ. You are the worshipping warrior bride of Yeshua the Messiah. And you have the whole of heaven's armies and the cloud of witnesses behind you as we press forward to finish the race of the heavenly calling that God has called us to in Christ Jesus. Now let's continue our study of Revelation chapter 12, where I'm going to show you the great and wonderful destiny and calling of the worshipping warrior Bride of Christ, together with Yeshua the Messiah, to overcome and destroy the Antichrist and the Babylon beast system. Throughout Revelation chapter 12, it's talking about three main things, Yeshua, the Bride, and the dragon Satan with his Antichrist beast system, that persecutes God's people because of Yeshua and the bride. Another very important golden nugget given to us in Revelation chapter 12 is the strategy for the bride on how to defeat the Antichrist and his beast kingdom in both time periods of persecution. But first, let's talk about what it is not. Ephesians 6 verse 12 says that we don't war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness and spiritual forces of wickedness in the spiritual realm. It's really important to understand that this is a spiritual war, not a physical one. And therefore, the only way that we can overcome is with spiritual weapons, not physical ones. The Bible prophesies about the fact that there will be a resistance group of people who will try to assassinate the Antichrist. But when you try to fight a spiritual war with physical weapons, you play straight into the enemy's hand meaning that it will backfire and only serve to further the Antichrist's agenda. Scripture prophesies that the Antichrist will receive a fatal head wound and shock the world by appearing to be dead. And then the false prophet in front of the whole world, which I assume is via television, with deceiving signs, wonders and counterfeit miracles, which are really a lie, will appear to raise the Antichrist from the dead. And this counterfeit resurrection will cause the global population to not only accept him as the one world leader, but to also be deceived into believing that he is the Messiah. So this is why it's really important to know the word of God, especially what the book of Revelation prophesies, given the times that we are soon going into. There is no human or group of people that can stop the Antichrist or kill him because he is a Nephilim. I will explain that in detail in episode 6. 
And scripture says that the Antichrist and the false prophet will be here right until the end of the tribulation. And Yeshua himself will be the one to throw the Antichrist and false prophet alive into the lake of fire after the battle of Armageddon. But the bride of Christ does have a destiny and calling to overcome the Antichrist and his beast system, and I'm going to show you how. Previously in this video, I spoke about how we need to prepare for the rapture and the marriage supper of the Lamb by washing our spiritual wedding garments in order to remove the black ink spots from them that Ephesians 5 verse 27 speaks about, which are the mindsets and ways of the kingdom of darkness, like fear, anxiety, worry, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, hurt, offense, strife, guilt, shame, rejection, unworthiness, a low self-esteem, fleshliness, worldliness, lukewarmness, etc. Through the blood of the Lamb, which is applied through repentance, which is like the soap that cleanses us of all unrighteousness, as 1 John 1 verse 9 says, and the sanctification of the soul through the washing of the water of the word, which is renewing the mind with the word of God in that area that we repented for, which now means changing our thinking and subsequently our way of living to come in line with God's ways as outlined in his word. So the two main agents we need to wash our wedding garments spiritually so that they can be pure, clean and white, ready for the wedding feast when Yeshua comes to fetch his bride at the rapture, is the blood of Yeshua and the word of God. With that understanding, you can now have a deeper appreciation of the meaning of the popular verse in Revelation 12 verse 11. They have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so as to shy away from death. The word of our testimony is the word of God. The blood of the Lamb applied through a lifestyle of repentance and sanctification of the heart and soul through renewing the mind with the word of God, which is our two-edged sword, are the weapons of our warfare to overcome the enemy Satan and the Antichrist and his beast system during the time of persecution, in the time of the fourth and fifth seal, in the three and a half years leading up to the rapture, as well as in the time of the Great Tribulation. I want to remind you of something I shared in the video of the four horses of Revelation. You are protected from the serpent Satan as your DNA is purified through repentance. Because if you do not have Satan's seed in you, he cannot see you and he cannot touch you because you are white, meaning that you are wearing bright white garments in the spiritual realm. The serpent cannot see light and is blind to white. You will be white and transparent because of purity, repentance, and because you abide in my covenant and by my word. And that is really true. There is a very powerful and inspiring testimony from a man called James Kawalya that has recently gone viral. He used to be an African witch doctor at the highest levels that one can go in Satanism and witchcraft. And he got born again and radically delivered and set free. And he now has a very powerful and effective deliverance ministry in Uganda because his previous experience in witchcraft and Satanism has now equipped him to be very effective in spiritual warfare because he knows how the enemy operates. If you are able to watch this testimony, I highly recommend it. The first part of it is very difficult to listen to as he shares the realities of what he went through in Satanism. And not everybody will be able to watch it because the abuse that he details that he went through may be too triggering for some. But if you are able to watch it, it's an excellent education. And in the second part of it, he shares some very inspiring, absolutely life-changing testimonies that show the reality of the spiritual authority we have in Christ 
when we know how to walk in it. And I personally don't think that there's a testimony that I have heard before that has changed my life as significantly as this one. It completely changed my prayer life and personal walk with God. So again, I highly recommend it if you can. Just to give you an example, I'm going to share one amazing experience that he spoke about in his testimony, because I want to show you the literal reality of what I've just been explaining to you from Revelation chapter 12. He spoke about what happened when just 20 women and one pastor got together to regularly pray, where for 90 days they applied a principle called covenant prayer, where they committed to praying together every day from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. during those 90 days. This specific time period was a strategy given to them by the Holy Spirit that relates to the story of Elijah when he overthrew the prophets of Baal at the time of the evening sacrifice, because they were directing their prayers to overthrow the specific principalities and spiritual forces of wickedness, witchcraft and Babylon in their particular territory. Part of the principle of covenant prayer is that it is a prayer of agreement. Remember Yeshua said in Matthew 18 verse 19, again, truly I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And they were so seriously committed to this agreement that they had with each other to do this covenant prayer for 90 days, that they said if one of them was late or did not attend on any day, they would go back to day one. During those six hours, their covenant prayer basically consisted of repentance, worship, and then spiritual warfare. The principle of covenant prayer is a spiritual weapon that's available to all of us, although it doesn't necessarily have to be six hours a day for 90 days. That was the strategy the Holy Spirit specifically gave them for what they were specifically dealing with. But the strategy that the Holy Spirit may give others in terms of the length of time and Times you pray may be different. But another part of the principle of covenant prayer is that it's not praying for just five minutes. It's really pressing into his presence with heartfelt sincerity for hours and hours. It's about really lingering in Abba Father's presence. Like Psalm 91 says, those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High. The other thing about covenant prayer is that you can't just decide, OK, tomorrow I'm going to do covenant prayer because there's a preparation that's involved in terms of sanctification and consecration needed in your personal life. A time when you seek Abba Father in repentance as you allow the Holy Spirit to highlight areas of your life that need to be put right. For example, dealing with and removing any idols in your life which is a non-starter for effective covenant prayer because idols in our life causes spiritual blindness. So fasting will often be involved in this pre preparation time. For example, if we have unhealthy eating and drinking habits or worldly forms of entertainment as a counterfeit form of comfort and escape or removing any other forms of idolatry in our life. And another important thing is dealing with any relationship breakdowns, hurt, offense, strife, bitterness, unforgiveness, etc. Because remember, Yeshua said in Matthew 5, verse 23 to 24. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So with covenant prayer, there is a preparation time of repentance, sanctification and consecration involved. But anyway, these 20 women and the one pastor leading them had no idea what was happening in the spiritual realm as a result of their faithful, committed prayer. Because like it is for all of us, when you pray, you're just speaking normally from your heart and there's often no amazing supernatural manifestation in the room. You don't always have goosebumps and 
tangibly feel God's presence or see angels or some type of supernatural experience. It's nice when those things happen, but most of the time we just do it by faith. It's not based on anything we can see or feel in the physical realm. And so in the same way, those 20 women and the one pastor leading them had no idea what was happening in the spiritual realm as a result of their faithful committed prayer. But this witch doctor and the Luciferians in the highest echelons of the Freemasonic elite knew it because they can see into the spiritual realm. And he said that what happened is 7,000 churches in various places all over the world, which were in spiritual slumber, woke up and a revival started in those places. And the highest and strongest demonic principalities of Freemasonry, Satanism and witchcraft got toppled over in a massive territory of land in Northern Africa and the Middle East between where they were praying in Uganda and Israel right up to Syria. Just because of those 20 women and that one pastor applying the weapons of spiritual warfare that God has given us in his word. When this man, James Kawalya, was a witch doctor, he was assigned by the Freemasonic elite to attempt to stop them because he said if they completed those 90 days of covenant prayer, the kingdom of darkness would have a total loss of any foothold or ability to operate in that territory of land for 70 years after their 90 days of covenant prayer ended. And unfortunately, he was able to stop them and reduce the spiritual authority they had built up through their regular prayer. And the way that he did it is very eye opening because it shows us the real serious reality of what the Bible told us all along. What he did is he studied each person to see what their weaknesses were and where they could gain a potential foothold and an open door. For example, the one lady had a wound in her heart related to her relationship with her mother. And all the witch doctor did with a few of them was to stir up circumstances to simply lead them to take offense and to allow bitterness and unforgiveness to take root in their hearts. And as another example, the pastor had a weakness with money. So one of their agents joined the church masquerading as a wealthy Christian, and they sowed a huge financial seed into his church and bought him a house as far away as possible from the location where they were having their prayer meetings. And they got him distracted and focused on the things that he was busy with from the money that had come in and things like that. And the witch doctor managed to break up this prayer group by eventually getting them all to have a fight with each other the day before they were about to finish their 90 days. And they had no idea the huge loss that took place in the spiritual realm. If they had just completed that one more day, there would have been 70 years of massive revival where the kingdom of darkness would not have been able to operate at all in that huge territory of land in northern Africa between Uganda and Israel right up to Syria. Imagine the dominoes effect in terms of how it would have even affected and changed things going on in the Middle East today. But nevertheless, even though they missed out on the full package of blessing beyond what they could have imagined that Abba Father wanted to do for and through them, the effort that they put in still had massive results and fruit that they were not even aware of, such as the 7,000 churches all over the world that woke up from spiritual slumber and the events resulting from their covenant prayer played a major uh, part in what ultimately resulted in the witch doctor being converted, born again and set free. And now that James is in full time ministry, thousands more have been saved, healed, delivered and set free through his ministry. So the fruits of their covenant prayer continues even until this day. So may that testimony inspire and encourage you 
concerning the reality of the spiritual authority that you have in Christ when you use the simple yet profoundly powerful spiritual weapons of warfare that Abba Father has given us, such as repentance, worship, and spiritual warfare in prayer. It really is genuinely and literally true when the Bible says that one can put a thousand to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight in the enemy's kingdom of darkness. Something else that James said that really struck me is that he shared the reality of the fact that the least in Abba Father's kingdom is greater than the greatest in the kingdom of darkness. Think about it. The strongest powers of Freemasonry and witchcraft were overthrown by 20 women and one pastor who applied the simple weapons the word has given us of repentance, worship and spiritual warfare in prayer. You see, the problem is that most of us Christians do not realize the literal reality of the power of the spiritual authority that we have in Christ and we don't walk in it or apply it. That's why Luke 16 verse 8 says, For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Unfortunately, those in the kingdom of darkness understand the reality of the spiritual realm much, much more than the children of God. But given the end times that we are moving into, that now needs to change. We need to know and understand the extreme importance and essential vital necessity of using our weapons of spiritual warfare that the word of God has given us, which we must use by faith, not by feelings based on our physical senses. And I also shared this testimony as a foundation as I'm in the process of proving and progressively showing you the powerful reality of what Revelation 12 verse 11 says when it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. The same weapons of the blood of the lamb applied through repentance and the word of God applied to our lives through renewing of the mind which washes our wedding garments so that they are pure white, ready for the rapture, are the same weapons available to us during the time of unprecedented persecution in the end times by the Antichrist beast system to overcome him and make us completely inaccessible to him, like Psalm 91 verse 8 says, and where we are completely out of the serpent's reach as Revelation 12 verse 14 says. There are times where Abba Father will change the physical geographic location of his people, like we've seen here in Revelation chapter 12, where the Jewish people of Israel will flee to Basra in modern day Jordan in the Great Tribulation, as soon as the abomination of desolation takes place. But more importantly, I'm also trying to show you how we can enter into God's supernatural protection in the spiritual realm, where we are completely invisible and inaccessible to the enemy, regardless of your physical location. To remind you of this very important principle I previously explained, I'm going to say it once again. You are protected from the serpent Satan as your DNA is purified through repentance. Because if you don't have Satan's seed in you, he cannot see you and he cannot touch you because you are white, meaning that you are wearing bright white garments in the spiritual realm. The serpent cannot see light and is blind to white. You will be white and transparent because of purity, repentance, and because you abide in my covenant and by my word. So, for example, in that testimony I shared with you about the 20 women, James shared how they could literally not initially see those 20 women in that pastor because they were hidden in a very bright light in the spiritual realm that literally blinded those in the kingdom of darkness, making it impossible for them to see them. 
they could only see and feel the effects of what was taking place in the spiritual and physical realm because of them. The blood of the Lamb applied through repentance and the word of our testimony, using the weapon of the word by living according to it, is a vital key that Abba Father has given us for these times to overcome the enemy and to enter into Abba Father's supernatural protection. Because when you apply these simple tools that the word of God has given us, you are genuinely invisible to the enemy. From his experience of being a high-level Satanist, an agent for the kingdom of darkness, James explained that you are like the wind. Where you cannot see wind, it's invisible. You can only see its effects, like the leaves of the trees moving and trees swaying as the invisible wind passes through it. So you cannot see wind, but you can see its effects. And in the same way, when you are invisible to the enemy, all he can see is the effects of your life, where the kingdom of darkness is fleeing all around you. Revival is taking place and people are being healed, delivered and set free because of you and the life that you live. Another incredible testimony that James shared that I want to share with you to show you the reality of what I am explaining here is he spoke about how he got to the place of having incredible spiritual demonic power as he rose to the top positions in the realm of witchcraft. He was one of the five top witch doctors over the whole of Africa. He had 7,000 witches and Satanists under him, and all he knew was the reality of the demonic power that he operated in, and that there was no other Satanist that had been able to overpower him. His first experience with a spiritual power greater than his, his own was when a Christian teacher and minister came to Uganda to do a conference where he would be teaching from the Word of God. This minister was living this lifestyle of repentance and sanctification that I've been telling you about, and so he had incredible authority in the spiritual realm. Now, you can have one Christian minister who teaches the word of God and says the name of Jesus and absolutely nothing happens. There's close to zero effect in the spiritual realm because his words have no power because of a lukewarm fleshly lifestyle of compromise with sin in the background, for example. And then you can have another minister who says the name of Jesus and speaks the exact same words from Scripture and massive things happen in the spiritual realm because of the great power and anointing of the Holy Spirit that rests on them as a direct result of their consecrated lifestyle of repentance and sanctification. And so their words carry massive power and have massive effects in the spiritual realm. James explained that when this particular minister was coming to Uganda, his name was Morris Cerullo, and the Freemasonic globalist elite contacted this witch doctor James and told him that this minister is coming. And they told James that he, along with all 7,000 of the witches under him, must urgently leave Uganda, because if they remained within several miles of this Christian minister, they would either literally physically die or be converted. And also, they could not return to Uganda for 21 days after this Christian teacher, Maurice Cerula, left because the vibrations of Holy Spirit power from the words that he spoke continued to echo and have effect in the spiritual realm even after he had left the country. And again, this minister, Maurice Cerulo, who was faithfully preaching the word of God, had no idea of the full extent of the massive effect that he was having in the spiritual realm because of what he was doing. He had no idea that one of the most powerful Satanists in Africa, with 7,000 witches and Satanists under him, had to flee the area because he was coming. And you see, when the kingdom of darkness is derailed from being able to operate in an area, bondages fall off people. 
They get healed of physical diseases. Miracles happen. Spiritual awakening and revival starts to take place. Another reason for the great impact that Morris Cerullo was having is because he was blessed to be surrounded by a small group of intercessors who faithfully surrounded him in prayer. And so one of the other reasons his word was having so much power and effect in the spiritual realm is because of the cumulative effect of the prayers of the intercessors that were coming together and their voices were combining with the minister's voice in the spiritual realm to significantly amplify the volume, power and effects of the minister's words in the spiritual realm as he preached. And I can also testify to the reality of this from my own personal experience. I'm extremely blessed to be surrounded by a phenomenally faithful group of intercessors in Singapore who have been regularly surrounding myself and Tammy, who works with me in Eagle's Wings for over five years now. And I've noticed the reality of the anointing of their prayers increasing over time, simply because of their faithfulness to be consistent in regularly praying over all this time. And I could speak for over an hour telling you testimony after testimony of miracles and magnificent rescues that I have had in dangerous situations and heavy spiritual warfare because of their prayers. To give a small personal testimony, just this past month, Tammy ran over her dog. She felt and heard the crunch as she drove her car over him. And I saw the dog with my own eyes. His foot was crushed flat and his pelvis was clearly broken. Also confirmed by a vet who came to the house to look at him. And you could visibly see how his back legs and pelvis was disjointed from the rest of his body. Now, obviously, our intercessors mainly pray over us and the ministry work we are busy with in Eagle's Wings. But we sent them an SOS message to please pray for Tammy's dog. And we saw a miracle take place overnight. He was completely healed and follow up x-rays showed no fractures. There's absolutely nothing wrong with him now. Anyway, that was just the most recent of a multitude of such miracles that take place in our lives because of the spiritual authority and anointing that is progressively built up through the faithfulness of the intercessors that surround us. And I know how vitally important they are. I know that it would not be possible for us to do the end time work that Abba Father has called us to do without them. And I can tell you for a fact that I would not be here today if it was not for them. I would have been taken out years ago by the enemy, which nearly happened. But I literally was saved by Abba Father's hand as a direct result of their intercession. And so I am extremely grateful for them. I never asked them to be our intercessors. Abba Father gave them the calling and they responded to that call in obedience with outstanding faithfulness. And that is a work that he is doing in ministries worldwide, where he is calling groups of intercessors to surround those that he has called to share his word, especially his prophecies related to the end times and all that is described in the book of Revelation. And so to the intercessors that are listening, don't underestimate the vital importance that you have in Yahweh's end time army. Anyway, coming back to the testimony of this minister who came to Uganda, who had such a dramatic impact in the spiritual realm. James and the agents of the kingdom of darkness working with him devised a strategy to reduce the spiritual authority and power of this man's ministry. And they could not get to him personally. The minister himself did not sin, for example, but how they succeeded was by breaking down the wall of intercessors around him. And again, it was through the seemingly small, simple things that I mentioned earlier, such as getting the intercessors to allow resentment, bitterness and unforgiveness to take root in their hearts and to take offense so that they slowly started to withdraw and to step back from their intercession, getting some of them to become jealous of the minister's platform and to covet it for themselves, not realizing that the role that they had behind the scenes as intercessors 
was just as vitally important and significant as the minister on the stage. And through allowing these dark ink spots on their spiritual garments, they progressively managed to reduce the spiritual authority and impact of this Christian minister's ministry. And I shared the story to again highlight the importance to you of washing off the black ink stains on our spiritual wedding garments with the blood of the lamb and the washing of the water of the word and also maintaining the cleanliness of our spiritual garments through a lifestyle of repentance and renewing our mind to align with the word of God on a daily basis. Because we just can't afford these black ink spots, which represents areas of unrepented sin in our lives. I've repeated this principle shown on the slide several times now in the teaching on the four horses of Revelation and in this video on Revelation chapter 12. And I won't be mentioning it again because there is too much else to cover in the other videos of this book of Revelation series. So I'm really spending time on this now and I hope and pray that this really sinks into your heart, mind, soul and DNA as a work of the Holy Spirit and that he will bring this principle alive with revelation for you of how we can be invisible and inaccessible to the enemy and how we can overcome him through the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony because we are really, really going to daily need it in the time ahead. We've come to the place in world history where it is really, really important for us to understand this. Because in not many years from now, we are going into a time of unprecedented persecution. And the reality for us in this time is that we are going to be engaged in a massive spiritual war between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And this daily lifestyle of applying the blood of the lamb through repentance and sanctification through the washing of the water of the word is vitally essential for us, not just to prepare us for the rapture, but to keep us in a strategic position of advantage over the enemy, where we are invisible and inaccessible to him under Abba Father's supernatural protection. And where, as the worshipping warrior bride, operating in the unprecedented spiritual authority and anointing of the Holy Spirit in the days of Elijah, we can make incredible advances in defeating the kingdom of darkness worldwide. And this spiritual war between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness is not a time where we can afford to be passive or to have open doors to the enemy through black ink spots on our spiritual garments, which represents areas of unrepented sin in our lives, because small areas of compromise can become massive open doors to the enemy, not, and not only reducing our spiritual authority and effectiveness in the spiritual realm, like in the testimony I just shared with you, but those open doors can, with no exaggeration, be potentially life-threatening in these crucial end times that we will soon be living in. So from now on, this lifestyle of keeping our spiritual wedding garments pure, white and clean, with the soap and water of repentance and sanctification through the washing of the water of the word, must be something that we purposefully, wholeheartedly and aggressively pursue on a daily basis until the time of the rapture. Because it keeps us protected from the enemy and ensures that we are ready for the rapture. Revelation 19 verse 7 to 9 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. She has been given the finest of pure, bright, and clean white linen to wear. For the fine linen represents the righteous deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, Write this, 
Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words that come from God. In the same light, Revelation 3 verse 18 says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and have white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. The last part of that scripture that speaks about salve to put on your eyes so that you can see is referring to spiritual blindness, which we get rid of through removing the idols in our lives. Because as I previously explained, it is the idols in our lives that causes spiritual blindness, reducing our spiritual authority and the effectiveness of our prayers and putting at us at risk of not being ready for the rapture because of the state of lukewarmness that idols puts us into. There's many scriptures like this one, which in the context of speaking about preparing for the rapture and the marriage supper of the Lamb, talks about the importance of washing our wedding garments so that they are clean and white and so that, that we don't get caught naked and unprepared. And with that in mind, I would like to share an 11 minute extract from another video by this man, Pastor James Kawalya, sharing about the reality of the fact that we really do wear garments in the spiritual realm. And when we compromise with sin, the demons in the kingdom of darkness can snatch those garments from us that protect us, resulting in us being naked and exposed in the spiritual realm. The links to the full videos of both videos of James that I've spoken from are in the description below this video. But listen to what he says. And the last one. We all have been talking about it, the consecration. Mm. That one is a lifelong be set apart. You, you that that's the you always con and I say this. I'm still going through my deliverance until I make it to heaven. Mm. You are still going through deliverance until you make it to heaven. There is no day you can say it's over. Because mm. there are a lot of things that still the Lord is transforming you from glory to glory. Would you would you say like this as well, or would you say this way where I guess the three stages of self salvation mm -hmm. where you have been saved, mm -hmm. you're being saved, mm -hmm. and you're going to be saved, and you have been saved is the redemption, mm -hmm. the work of the cross, you know, all of that, and then the you're being saved sanctification, that process that we're in right now. And then you're going to be saved is the glorification when Jesus finally returns. Mm -hmm. It's a journey. Yes. That's why we need to walk with the Lord every day. They, I think this walk of Christianity is consecration. Mm. I don't know how much I can emphasize holiness, mm. being blameless. Mm. I'm telling you, whatever you will ask me, I'll tell you the answer is in holiness. And you know, that's one of the messages the enemy fights so much. And not God will not deliver you on your terms. Mm, on his terms. Not as we not as you want, but mm -hmm. as he wants. Mm -hmm. And what does he want? Be holy, for I am holy. Be holy. Uh, it doesn't, you know, when you say, I don't believe in that, my theology, my what, I don't believe in it, my denomination, it's up to you. He has his turn is be holy. Be holy. And when I was in the kingdom of darkness, there were three kinds of belief Christians. Mm. There were those who could be in the service, but naked, not dressed, but they have put on their clothes. But when you look at them, they, are, they don't, they don't, they look, you can see their nakedness mm. in the service. They can be leading even worship, but you can look at them and see their nakedness. Mm. You know why? Those who were living in sin. You know what sin does? Me who came from darkness, from the kingdom of darkness, mm. I know what sin what could do to the people who are in church. Mm. That's why I avoid it. You, you know it even more than the people in church because they've taken it for granted. Oh, you know. See, yeah. you know, you, you, when you put on like I'm dressed, yes. you have also a spiritual garment. Mm, mm. You have what you're dressed in. Now, when you sin, you give that garment
to demons. They wow. take it. Wow. So you many Christians today, they lost their garment. Wow. They lost it. So they're spiritually naked. When Jesus comes back, he's not going to come back for your name. <laughs> he's coming for a church without spot. Spot. For a garment. Yeah. We shall be dressed. That's why in Revelation say, who are those? dressed in white and you know jesus says to the church as well you're poor miserable it's all about being naked as well and yeah. blind and blind so many people today they are praying but because they are naked they can't be allowed into the presence of god mm -hmm. their prayer they, is ineffective they're all effective because it's not how you look it's how you're dressed mm. that you know your, your rank and your status in the spirit so the naked the, there's a group of people who because of sin, they lost their garment. They are preachers. They could stand on the, on the pulpit and preach. And I come in a meeting and I see them naked. All how they were created, their body, their, their physical and their spiritual bodies naked because of sin. And they're busy jumping. God is great. But they're naked. <laughs> you know, and because, wow. of, because of that, the, their protection, the angel of the Lord on their life turns away from them. Ooh. It's like the angel cannot look at you because the angel is supposed to serve you. Mm. But because you are naked, he can't look at you. Mm. He turns away from you. Mm. And meaning when he turns away from you, you are at the mercy of the enemy. Mm. Now, at that moment, Satan will not destroy you because you are an asset. Mm. you're going to be a gate to destroy others because of your influence and your yeah your position in the church because of your sin now your sin will be a gate to defile everyone around you so that preacher for example or minister or, or, or intercessor or singer what they're doing from the platform they're doing it their their sin is being amplified like, so it's, it's the anointing so it's, it's an impartation. So, so are you saying the impartation is not just the laying on of hands? The but see, see, this is why Christians need to be concerned about who they're listening to. You can't just listen to anyone. Because word, words are spiritual. Words are spirit. The word you speak is, is spirit. Jesus said the words I speak to you. Spirit and a life. So words are spirit. If I speak to you, it's spirit. If you listen to me, it's spirit. So it's not just what you're saying, it's where you're saying it from. Where you what saying? you're carrying in that place is transmitted through the word. So the words are like a transport system that carries the realm you're in and releases it to the people that are listening to you. So, so you know, when the Lord says you, do not let your anger go through the day. When the Lord says you, repent immediately. Don't wait for tomorrow. Forgive now. He said, you're losing your garment mm. and you're going to destroy lives. So there, there's a, those, those who lost their garments. That's one group I could always see in the church. Those who, who, lost, the who lost their garments. And maybe let me ask you, do you still have your garment? <laughs> Are you dressed? Because the Bible says, put off mm. the flesh and put, put on, on Christ. Can you put on Christ on sin with oh. immorality? With bitterness, with uh, anger, with unforgiveness. And forget can you put on Christ on the, with that? Can he allow you to dress him to put on Christ with anger, with bitterness, with unforgiveness? You see? You know, when Paul says that do not even eat with a brethren who someone who calls himself a brethren, but is a fornicator. Mm. That's what he's saying. Because of the defilement that comes by that company. Yeah. We are in the days when people take sin lightly. Mm. In the kingdom of darkness, we know, we used to know, sorry, the sin in a man. Mm. Because the sin of a man, you always see it on their garments, mm. in the spirit. And so that seed, where the spot is, is where the arrow is targeted. Wow. That's the entry so, point for the attack. Demons, witches and wizards, let me tell you, like 5,000 can start to hit on one spot for days, for days, because they found one spot on you to hit on. And the more they hit on that, it becomes soft and soft until it begins to spread into your whole spirit. Now, when it spreads into your spirit, that's what you release to the people. 
That's what you release to your family. That's what you release to your friends. That's what you release when you sing. It's what you release. So they are always now, they're using you as a conduit to release, to spread that. That's how sin spreads in churches. That's how sin spreads in cities. That's how sin spreads in nations. Now, the people who are ministering are saying things that are theologically right, but they're spiritually wrong. As in, they're from a different place spiritually. They're from a wrong source in the spirit. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the second one, the second group of Christians that I want to talk about is those that are wounded mm. and are not healed. Mm. You know, you cannot, you may not have sinned, mm. but you will not let God heal your wound. Mm. And the third, those that are deceived in their achievements. Mm. And that's where, you know, there's a sin. There's, you, there's one who is walking in sin. Mm. Now, this is sin, but this is now a stronghold because you are trapped in your achievements mm. and that has become your idol. Mm. So that idol be, you makes you uh, a, an abomination before God and it turns away from you. Mm. What I'm trying to say that many times people confess, I believe in Jesus, but the Lord has turned away from them. Truth. Wow. Because he can't look at sin. God cannot look at sin. Cannot. You can say, I'm under the grace. You can quote scriptures. You can quote things. You can quote your beliefs. But he remains holy. He cannot look at sin. He is holy. Mm. And holy. And holy. And he demands and says, be holy. Mm. Be holy. Walk pure. In our generation, we are taking over this generation, not because we are good preachers, mm -hmm. because we've decided to consecrate ourselves and pursue holiness. Amen. Not our, on our terms, but on his terms. Yeah. He's what he calls holiness, not what we want to be holiness. Mm. Not what we want, because there's what we want, and we get all kind of things. We try to teach it. We try to prove what we want, and it's a good sermon, it's a good theory. But that is that the holiness God is demanding. Mm. You are he, you are watching. Is that what God is demanding from you? The holiness. I'm telling you, James. There are times, there are things the Lord allowed me to do some years ago. He cannot allow them to me to do them now. Mm. A few years ago, it was okay. But the more I walk close with God, the more he demands more. Mm. The times, if you've done something, it's about what you've done. But this time, even what I've thought. Mm -hmm. Then he said, James, repent. That thought, you thought wrong. Now, even a thought. Mm. Holiness is not perfection. It is a separation from sin and the ways of the world through repentance and renewing of the mind, so that you can fully dedicate and consecrate yourself to Abba Father, so that you can fulfill the destiny and calling that he has for your life, and so that you can walk in the massive spiritual authority, Holy Spirit anointing and power, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Romans 12 verse 1 to 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, dedicating all of yourselves, holy, devoted, consecrated, and set apart for him, well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, intelligent act of worship and spiritual service. And do not be conformed to this world any longer, with its external superficial customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove for yourself what the will of God is that is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. The highway of holiness spoken about in Isaiah 35 verse 8 leads us into the ark of his supernatural protection. We enter the ark of his supernatural protection through a lifestyle of holiness, 
through a pathway of repentance where we apply the blood of the Lamb and through using the weapon of the word by living according to it and by removing the pride of life so that we no longer live for ourselves by removing fleshliness, worldliness, lukewarmness and compromise through crucifying the flesh and dying to self. Once again, Revelations 12 verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. The blood of the lamb and the word of God are the two wings that carry the woman representing God's people at different stages of the timeline of the final seven years of Revelation out of the reach of the serpent into the supernatural protection of Yahweh. So with all of that shared, I hope you can see the powerful reality of the Revelation 12 verse 11 key to entering into Abba Father's supernatural protection and doing massive damage to the kingdom of darkness at the same time, as you walk in the full extent of your incredible spiritual authority in Christ.